Howdy readers, I'm Jason, this is Chapter and Verse, and this is the latest video uh, in my Mortality Project, uh, which is called You Carry a Coffin uh, Today. Uh, I named the project after a uh, passage, a quotation uh, from Independent People by Halor Laxness. Um, uh, in this project, uh, I am uh, watching films and reading books that deal with uh, the subject of death. And um, this video is going to be focused on the 1993 film uh, Fearless, directed by Peter Weir. Now, Peter Weir is, I think, probably best known uh, for having directed uh, Dead Poets Society and Master and Commander, um, probably Picnic at Hanging Rock as well, which is a terrific, terrific film. Um, but he's much less known uh, for Fearless, which is unfortunate because it's absolutely brilliant. Um, like I said, this came out in 1993, which was one of the best years uh, ever for cinema. Uh, other films that came out that uh, year include Schindler's List, uh, The Piano, uh, The Remains of the Day, uh, What's Eating Gilbert Grape. So it was a strong year for movies. Uh, the Fugitive came out that year, The Firm came out that year. Um, Jurassic Park came out that year. Um, Fearless is about uh, a man who survives a plane crash and, uh, and a woman who survives that same plane crash uh, but whose baby uh, died in the, in the plane crash. It is about salvation. Uh, it is about finding uh, that in our lives which is um, rewarding, uh, which is thrilling, which is fulfilling, uh, and how difficult that can be to do. Uh, the film stars uh, Jeff Bridges. Uh, this was five years before The Big Lebowski, five years before he became the dude. Um, and actually his performance uh, in the film uh, to my to my mind, really harkens back uh, a great deal to his performance in Starman in the early '80s. Um, so, having come through this plane crash, uh, his character uh, Max um, comes to seem rather uh, sort of otherworldly, um, preternaturally calm, in the same way um, or in a similar way as uh, as Bridges. Um, alien character in Starman uh, would seem uh, to to the viewer and to uh, the other characters in the film. So coming through this plane crash, uh, he has come to feel uh, invincible, right? Uh, there's one scene where he walks across a number of lanes of traffic in Los Angeles or San Francisco. I can't remember where it takes place now. And um, and uh, essentially just shouts out to God, right? I mean, he says, you want to kill me, but you can't. And, um, and so, you know, I find myself wondering um, to what extent uh, any human being can conquer or can uh, mitigate their fear of death. Um, Kelly and I were watching one of the recent uh, Star Trek films just the other night, and, um, and in the scene, um, Spock is sort of gravely injured, and, um, and Spock says something to the effect of... Uh, uh, fear of death um, is illogical and Bones, right, the doctor played by Carl Urban um, says fear of death is what keeps us alive and I thought it was uh, I mean I had seen that film a number of times but I had never tied it to Fearless uh, I think because I had just never watched them in close uh, proximity to each other but I watched Fearless a couple of weeks ago yeah and it just it, it really I mean the film leaves me wondering um, it's a number of things about life and death, right? Um, so as far as, uh, as far as our existence goes, um, how do we find meaning? Where do we find meaning uh, in, in our existence? Um, you know, he has a wife in, in the film, he has a son, he has uh, an important uh, job as an architect, and um, he never post plane crash uh, in in the film. He never really feels alive, um, except in those moments where he is daring uh, death, which is 
obviously not a healthy thing. But then late in the film, right after he has been through um, a pretty serious trial uh, in which he's crashed his car to prove a point to um, to the other uh, survivor who lost her baby, uh, she's played by Rosie Perez. When he gets out of the hospital and he goes home, um, you know, he he asks his wife to save him. Uh, his wife, who has come to feel increasingly distant uh, from him um, post plane crash. And I think in that moment, he has come to realize that he hasn't been saved from the plane crash. Um, he has been uh, somehow uh, fooled into um, believing an illusion about his life. Uh, right? I mean, throughout the film, uh, he is constantly talking about how they have passed through death, right? These plane crash survivors, and that they're ghosts. And, um, and you know, part of me is, is finds that, that idea uh, intriguing, right? To what extent is that true? People who have passed through a crisis or a trauma of some kind, something that really should have taken their life. And, um, I mean, to what extent have those people cheated death? To what extent are they, are they ghosts? You know, I mean, I think about uh, people that uh, I'm close to who have come through um, very dicey uh, situations. Um, my mother was in the hospital a few years ago um, for, I think, two months or something. Yeah, and there were times where I, I didn't think she was going to make it, right? Um, you know, there were times uh, in the first couple of days where... Uh, she, I mean, she wasn't terribly lucid and, um, and she, um, you know, she talked about, um, having dreamt of the, uh, Battle Hymn of the Republic, right? And, uh, which, which doesn't seem like a terribly promising thing to, um, to have in one's thoughts or dreams, uh, when one is, is that ill, you know, but she, she made it and, uh. I don't know, I just, I, I wonder about this, right? Like, I wonder about uh, what goes on in the minds, in the hearts, and the souls of people who um, are that close to death, uh, that are in that close proximity to, to death. What is the difference between uh, being saved, right? Which seems to me um, something that has to do with our physical nature, with our cor corporeal nature, uh, with our life as a biological uh, entity and um, and salvation, which is somehow uh, it doesn't seem to be about um, our biology so much. Um, salvation seems to have much more to do with our soul. And, um, you know, if we don't subscribe to the idea of a soul, I do, I'm sure some of you don't, you know, salvation still has uh, somehow something more to do with uh, that which is beyond biology, whether it's our relationships, um, the love that we feel for others. Um, salvation is uh, more mysterious uh, somehow, I think. And uh, in, the, in the movie, um, it's constantly sort of walking this tightrope, uh, which is an interesting way of putting it, I suppose, um, since at one point in the movie, um, on the cover of the film, we see it, uh, Jeff Bridges is literally standing on the edge of a very, very tall building. Uh, but the movie's constantly walking this tightrope between uh, what being saved uh, means and what salvation uh, means. Um, because even though he has been saved and he's constantly sort of uh, daring God or daring death, to um, to take his life from him because he doesn't think it can be done. Um, he is still largely uh, miserable. He tells people, right, that the plane crash was the best thing that ever happened to him. Um, and, and, and I think the reason that he um, has convinced himself of that or, or, is, or is telling other people that at the very least uh, is because it did do something extraordinary for him, right? So at the end of the film, when we actually finally see the plane crash and what happens to him, when he realizes uh, that the steering on the plane is gone and that they're gonna, that they're gonna be crashing, 
he is every bit, if not more so, uh, panicked than any other passenger uh, on the plane. And um, it's only when uh, he, there's this moment where he sees this uh, light, this flare of the sun uh, through the window, and he has this epiphany, right? right? He realizes this is the moment of his death. And, um, and he becomes incredibly calm and uh, finds himself uh, in a position where he can help uh, somehow um, diminish uh, the fear and uh, the anxiety, that kind of existential terror um, in, in other people on, on the plane. And uh, he gets up and he walks down the aisle and, and um, you know, he's patting people on the shoulder and, and somehow he becomes a kind of angel uh, in that scene and uh, takes a seat next to a boy who has nobody with him and uh, lets him know it's going to be okay, right? Um, not necessarily that they're going to live, but uh, it's going to be okay, right? Um, he is there in that moment to help calm uh, these these people uh, for whom calm is, is, is the furthest thing from their minds. And, uh, and I think there's something really beautiful about that. Um, something, again, really uh, mysterious about that. What happens in those moments? There's only been one time in my life where uh, I, I felt like I was, I was close to death. And, um, you know, and it, it happened so quickly. There was no kind of lucidity um, at all in that moment. Um, I mean, it was just sheer terror, sheer panic. And, uh, you know, but if I were in a situation, right, whether it was on a plane or on a ship or, um, you know, in a bed in hospice or something like this, where I felt like I had um, minutes, if not hours, to, uh, to contemplate what was happening, what I was in the throes of, um, might I not find myself uh, lucid, find myself in a situation where um, I felt like uh, the best use of the, the last moments that I had would be to reassure people, um, to reassure my family members, right? Uh, to reassure the, the other passengers uh, around me like he does. And what, uh, what brings somebody to that uh, in that moment? What what makes people think that uh, that that is the best way to spend their time? Like I, I don't think this is something that they're kind of running through a kind of you know intellectual process about like is this logical or anything like that. You know I think it's an impulse um, more than more than anything else. Um, I don't know, but I find I, I find that the fact that the film dares to walk that line, dares to ask those questions, uh, dares to wonder uh, what surviving death um, can do to a person's sense of self or a person's identity. Uh, I, th I think it's a, a, just a fascinating film. Um, it's it's a, a much more, I think, philosophical film than, uh, than anything else Peter Weir has done, uh, maybe with the exception of uh, a Picnic at Hanging Rock. But um, what do you guys think? Uh, what did you guys think of this movie? Had you ever seen it before? I was uh, deeply impressed uh, by the movie. I hadn't seen it probably in, I don't know, 12 or 15 years, something like this. I was really disappointed uh, when we, uh, Dan and I put it in the, uh, the projector. Um, it was a uh, full frame. <laughs> And, uh, and I am not a fan of films that have been modified from their original version. Um, my guess is the only reason I owned this in full frame is that uh, it was probably only available in full frame on DVD when it came out because that was still a time when people thought that they were seeing more of the image if it took up their whole TV screen. Um, I remember my father was convinced of that. And... Uh, um, when, so I owned Michael Winterbottom's film Jude on VHS and then I bought it on DVD when it came out. It was in widescreen on DVD. 
And, um, and I remember queuing up the same image and pausing the same image in the film for my dad and then toggling back and forth between the full frame version of that image and the widescreen version of that image. And it was so dramatically different that um, initially my father uh, didn't understand what he was looking at. And, uh, but it convinced him, <laughs> to say the least, that uh, widescreen is what you want. So I had a look, and um, and Fearless is now available on Blu-ray uh, in its in its widescreen version. So um, Kelly and I will probably uh, replace this at some point soon. But yeah, I uh, I loved it. I think more than um, than I ever did before, especially that last um, sequence with the plane crash. Um, it just felt operatic to me. It felt virtuosic. It felt um, like a really likely. Uh, a really good approximation of what uh, it would be like in a situation like that, where time might feel like it's slowing down, uh, where everything is disorientation um, and heightened emotion and uh, and panic and a physical touch, right? There's a moment when these two sisters, like their hands cross the aisle from each other, they're holding hands and they're reaching out uh, for each other's hands. It's beautifully done. That is probably my favorite um, sort of stretch of filmmaking in any of the Peter Weir films that, that I've seen. And, uh, and that's really saying something because uh, he has never made a film that I've disliked. So um, later this week, uh, I will be coming back with a video on Frank Stanford's poems uh, from The Light, The Dead Sea. And, uh, and then we will move on uh, into our June uh, viewing and reading for the Mortality Project. So let me know what you thought of Fearless in the comments below. And I will uh, talk to you guys again uh, very soon. Adios.